Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to workshop four, the use of technology in inclusive education and training. My name is Eunice Ceres, and I'm the moderator of this workshop. I'm a medium height. The big the blue shirt with thin white stripes in the background is a wall and a window overlooking the sky. Now, um, I would like to inform you that to activate captions, click on the closed captions button on the control bar on your screens. Spanish interpretation is available. You can activate them by clicking the interpretation button on the control bar and then choosing your language. Click the mute original audio option to hear the interpreter clear, clearly. Share your comments and questions in the chat box. I will also ask you to uh, please remain muted. And if you'd like to speak, please raise your hand via the control panel on the right. Um, this workshop uh, will address how technology can promote participation in an educational setting for students with disabilities, including during the COVID-19 pandemic. The workshop will also present the national example of Israel regarding the policy of framework for the use of technology to support students with disabilities. And now I would like to pass the floor to Noah Nixon for their first presentation. No, floor is yours. Yes. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. I will uh, share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Is that okay? Yes. Okay, so um, I have um, brown hair. I am wearing glasses. I'm at my office. I wanted to do it from my home, but the internet failed half an hour ago, <clears throat> which is a great example about technology and how it could be so great and sometimes very fragile. So I hope it won't be too nosy here because I'm in my office. I'm going to talk about technology to promote participation for students with disabilities in schools activities. Um, I'm an occupational therapist in my background, and I'm the director of the Technology Center at Beth Easy Shapiro in Israel. A few words about uh, the organization where I work. Uh, Beth Easy Shapiro is one of the leading organizations in Israel in the field of disabilities. With four decades of experience with a wide range of disabilities and across multiple cultures, we are impacting uh, half a million people each year. Uh, we work in Israel and abroad. Uh, we also have special consultant status at the UN. There are many units and department at Bet Easy, but I think the most relevant to this presentation is that we have educational framework. We have early intervention center for very young children, Hebrew and Arabic speakers, and also special education school. In our technology center, uh, we work about uh, assistive technology, obviously. Very hard about implementation, when I'm, which I'm going to talk uh, later. Share our knowledge, like what I'm doing here. And also uh, in development area, which is very unique for us as therapists and educator to work also with uh, developers and designer and to have such a great uh, influence. So we are going to talk about technology and education for student disabilities, some principles and examples. And then in the end, very shortly, I don't have a lot of time, a little bit about what we did with the COVID-19 pandemic, and what we have learned, and the, some about the regulation and procedures in Israel, in this field, of course. So I think the most important principle I can say is to think about participation, according to the ICF uh, from the WHO. Um, this is the model that you are working according to and, and participation, I think is the most important thing from there because when we're working for people with disability and for sure when we're talking about technology, we have in our mind how to promote participation. We're not here uh, to fix anyone. We're here to think how to promote participation in social context according to the needs and the wants of a person. And it's very relevant when we're talking about technology and to emphasize the ability and not the disability of a person. We have to consider implementation. It's very important to be updated and to know what technologies are out there, uh, but it's much more important to put the offer, effort on implementation. Many times technology just stay on the shelf because of bad implementation. And when I'm talking about implementation, uh, we really work in very multidisciplinary approach 
Uh, we train and support the staff how to use the technology in different environments, a guide for appropriate use, and also to, how to take care of the equipment and all the time support the students and the parents. And I have to say that a lot of our resources and time go to the implementation. And we're talking a lot about inclusion. So technology, first of all, it's a tool for life. So it's promote inclusion. But if we're talking about education, and it doesn't matter if it's in the mainstream school, special education system, we usually talk these years about mainstream technology, which is very important for inclusion and normative tool. It's very, it's very good on a matter of reducing stigma. And for students with disability that are going to, that are going to mainstream school, sometimes technology is the only way. And I really recommend you uh, to read. There's a lot of uh, resources and uh, you can find on the web about the UDL, Universal Design for Learning, which means that like children don't like the same food, they're not learning in the same way. So it's about how the teacher uh, act and express and deliver the, um, all the materials, how the children can represent themselves and very important, the engagement. And I hope you can see in my examples now how we uh, use all those uh, factors. So here are a few examples. First of all, how technology promotes education. We saw that we see the technology really uh, promote active participation, make the lesson accessible, uh, encourage experiential learning, repeated practice. The children can go back and back if it's on their iPad, for example. They can use it at home and again, much more engagement. And uh, I would like to start with uh, the example of uh, this child, Ariel. Here is eight years old, he's not from Batizzi Shapiro. I used to work in the Ministry of Education with children that are integrated to the mainstream school like Ariel. Ariel um, is very clever and is, is an amazing child, but he has, and he has a muscular dystrophy um, disease. So he is very weak and also learning disability, dyslexia and dysgraphia. And I can talk for hours about the process. I worked for many, worked for many years with him, but the main conclusion, because we see today many children move from notebook to computer, to laptop or to tablets. And, uh, the, but it's not like this. It's like, uh, you have to think about, uh, first of all, professional assessment. It's not enough to say that it is a writing skill. It's not good enough. Let's go to typing. Um, I recommend that it will be by occupational therapist. And um, again, about implementation, how is going to use the laptop in the classroom? How is going to organize all the subjects? Uh, you have to work very closely with the family and the staff. And the last point is very important, which is emotional support. And we know that it doesn't matter which technology you start to use. It could be hearing aid, it could be a walker, and it could be a laptop, which is a very normative. It means something for a child to start to use technology. So you have to give the time for the process to do work, emotional work with him that is going to start using. It's not in one day just to start and he suddenly come to the classroom with the laptop. You can see here on the left is handwriting. It's in Hebrew. Um, it's right to left. If there is bad chance in a Hebrew reader in the audience, I still think that you cannot read his uh, writing. It's very not clear, a lot of spelling mistakes, no spaces between the words. And when he started to use the computer, suddenly many things became very easy to him. The organization on the, to organize everything on the paper, like the spaces. Child is, if you have a student who is this graphic or something and you say, erase, erase your mistakes, write it again, they will never do it. It's a lot of work, their paper will look not good. But when it comes to the computer, it's much, much easier. And suddenly we are really see a lot of abilities that we didn't see before, because it's much easier to do the delete, to do the space, and it's really empowering for the student. Now we share with you a few examples of Betty Z Shapiro School. So in our school, uh, we have students aged uh, 6 to 12 with motor and intellectual disabilities. We work in very uh, multidisciplinary approach, and we are very focused on the family also. And you can see here an example of one of our classes. You can see we have a big touch screen, with, which is really great for interactive learning. Um, the children uh, see some of them have an iPad, not all of them, um, and some have computer with eye gaze because they're using their eyes. They cannot, some, they cannot use his hand, their hands. And they have everything on their own screen, which is really great and make it very accessible. 
but it's not just about the screen. It's much more about Vanessa, the teacher that's standing there, which is such amazing teacher. And she's bringing everything to the classroom, the question, physical objects many times, but the screen just making it more accessible to them. Um, I'll show you a few things that we are using. So first of all, we use a lot open platform apps. And the reason we are doing it is because in the special education system versus the mainstream, we don't have prepared materials. We have to make it by ourselves. So we love to use those apps like TinyTap and JITap, which we can uh, create whatever we want. Um, and it's really, really open and it looks great, like you can see. And it could be about numbers, it could be about language, but it could be everything. It could be also social or uh, social stories or everything. And you can share it with other and you can download what other people do. Um, uh, we are having many activities there. <clears throat> Sorry. And this is an example uh, how we use TinyTap for another purpose. Like I said before, we really want to encourage the participation. So Rosh Hashanah is the Jewish New Year holiday. It's a very important holiday in Israel. And uh, we wanted to make greeting cards with the children. So we took the tiny type like a canvas, like a white blank canvas. And they can choose a picture and choose what they want to say to mommy and daddy and draw very easily because it's so accessible. And then we even print it out and give it to the parents with a candy of, uh, with a jar of candies. And then the day after we get this message from for the mom. And she said, um, yesterday we received a New Year's greeting from our daughter for the first time. She chose the words, she took photos and she chose the pictures, something so small that left us sitting on the sofa into the night, unwilling to say goodbye to this day, to the feeling, thank you so much, have a great day and a wonderful year. And we were so emotional about it. We didn't even think about it, it will be such a great, such an emotional impact of the parents. It's the first time their daughter, she's nine years old to get a greeting card, which she really made. We didn't make it for her. So this is an example of participation. Uh, another thing that we are using a lot is the grid three. Now the grid three is an AAC, uh, which AAC is augmentative alternative communication. There are software, in general, AAC, it's solution for people who are not, which are not verbal. We are using software, those software and apps for children uh, to communicate. But what's unique here is that we use it for education. So you see the symbols, each symbol represents a word. It's a universal, it's in all languages. Uh, here it's in Hebrew, obviously. And each, each symbol represents a word. And when you use it on an iPad, you hear the message. So there is a voice engine inside. And uh, this is a current event lesson that we're having every week. The children loves it. And this lesson was about the hippo that ran away from the zoo, which is a very nice story, a very interesting story. And they can really read it because of the symbols. They can take it home and even tell their parents what happened. And it's also, again, promote the, the communication with the family. And we always add like a video so they can see it and things like this. And we even took it a step further. So here in the picture, we took the grid three, which all the symbols and the teacher, she made uh, the template to teach the children to build sentences, which it's really amazing to see our children with complex disability learn how to build sentences in the right way with the objects and everything. And, and this is the only way they can do it. So it's great for learning language, but it's also great for their life. So here, a great example, we um, working a lot with a student about self-advocacy. And in the International Accessibility Day for people with disability uh, this year, um, the teacher told them, let's check if our gate to the school is accessible. So they checked and guess what? They found out it's not accessible, the gate to our school. So they have the tools now with the symbol and this, the grid three and the software, and they wrote a letter to the principal, to the manager of Betty Z. Shapiro. Listen, we checked the gate, it's not accessible, which is a great lesson and give them the voice. And this is the way they can uh, express themselves and they fix the gate, happy to say. <laughs> Another thing that we love to do is using the iPad camera. It's very easy and accessible versus the old cameras that we have. Here is an example how we use it uh, in language lesson, like to go around look, um, um, looking for objects that start with B. So one student 
can use it with an iPad, with his hands, his friends is in a wheelchair using an external switch that he can uh, press with his head and then take a picture on the iPad. And then they go back to the classroom and make an activity with all the pictures that they just took. Another thing that it's important is typing. Typing is a tool for life. Think about how many times you type today. Uh, for people with disability, it's sometimes even more important if, or because they cannot write some of them or because they use technology so much. So we use uh, typing on an iPad and a computer with uh, some, some of them even with eye gaze. Um, it's really, really uh, interesting. And we love to use uh, this app. It's uh, an app that we've developed, the EasyBoard. We did it with SAP in Israel. It's a virtual keyboard that allow visual customization. You can decide the way your keyboard is going to look like and you can use it on your iPad in any app that you are using. So you can see that you can decide how the keyboard is look, look like, but also you can see on the bottom that you can choose which letters will appear, which is something very important for children with complex disability, especially at the beginning, uh, because it's too many letters at the beginning. So today, if you come to our school, you can see that many of our students learn how to type their name, for example, which is really, really amazing. And again, think about participation, how important it is. And you can see that it's in English also. So you're really welcome to download it. All, all our apps are free in the App Store. Another app that we love to use in our, in our classes is uh, we use the EasyDocs, which is another app that we've developed for worksheets and digital binder. You can put any worksheet that you want and do it on an iPad. So it's great for children that you cannot write. In English, um, you have the Snape type, which is great. Um, and it's really promoting the independence of the children in the classroom. We also love to use playful apps. Again, the engagement. So I don't know if you're familiar with all the Toka Boca games. They're very playful apps. And we are taking those apps for teaching, for example, money skills with Toka Store. It's a game of a store, and, but we are using also uh, coins, real coins to teach how to use money. Or in the, on the right, you see uh, in language, language lesson is talk of kitchen. There are so many things you can do with a kitchen that is verbal, like it's uh, the um, objects and the verbs, uh, etc. For math, we're using many apps uh, that they are fun. We're always looking for nice apps, which are not, not uh, language dependent because uh, in a school, we are not speaking English, obviously. We love to use physical objects, like I said before. So if we are using Matific, for example, which is a great app for math, and it's in all languages, so it's in your language for sure, but we don't want just them to use the iPads. So we start with something in the classroom, we teach them about the order of the number, and then they're practicing, it's on the iPad. And there's, this is another app that we've developed, the EasyCalc. It's a calculator, again, that you can do your own uh, customization, uh, decide which number will appear, you can do records. So uh, it's, it's great to teach math with the EasyCalc and also uh, to teach them how to use calculator, which is very important to their life. They go to the grocery store, check the money that you are uh, paying. Here are websites uh, that are accessible and they're great for education. The Ginger Tiger has many games for math and language. Uh, El Kids Learn is a little more uh, playful, but they're all a great uh, website that I recommend. It's cool and it's children. So we have to think also about play and leisure. And for many children, digital games are more accessible. So we play with regular games, but also uh, we, um, use uh, digital games with our children for play for the sake of play. And like I said, also leisure. So this is cool and we have art activities. So we use a, a technology to paint. We have photography club. Uh, for music, we use the Arcana, which is amazing technology. It's accessible instrument, um, Israeli technology. And to see our children playing real songs by chords and with signs, thanks to this, the, the, the Arcana, it's, uh, it's really amazing. And now I have a few minutes, right? To talk about the COVID and uh, this is very short. So um, um, 
we, we, it was very immediate for everyone, the COVID. We weren't prepared to do everything remotely. So we had to find an immediate solution to support the children and the family through many kind of routine. It was very challenging, but what I want to emphasize that we got new for, uh, also useful tools for the future. And what we've done at Bet Easy, we find out that pre-recorded videos are very useful because you can see whatever and what time it's convenient for the family, you can see it again and again. It's great modeling for the parents. Uh, so each center, like I said, we have three educational center had its own YouTube channel. We also send the, the families uh, learning materials like presentation and more. And we send activity cards from therap therapists according to the goals of the students. So this is the way it looks like. So we have a um, YouTube channel for each uh, educational um, framework, two in Hebrew and one in Arabic. The Arabic one is obviously also for people outside of Israel. And there are hundreds of videos there. And it was so successful in Israel. It's not just for our families. And it's about math and language and morning circle and about the holidays and sport and yoga. And there are many videos there. And because it was so successful, we have now in Israel in the mainstream TV channel in Hot VOD, uh, Easy Kindergarten, uh, which children with and without disability can watch. It's really, really amazing. We also do, of course, a Zoom lesson, a synchronized Zoom lesson and activities, online session. You can see in all the areas, including game like Zoom Bingo, which was challenging. And it's not, um, not every child could, could participate. And the family, we really need to support them. Um, sometimes we hand over our part to the, ter to the parents, which is a problem. They are not therapists. They not always have the technology and they have distractions at home. But we found out a few benefits. There was a lot of sibling involvement you can see here in the picture. For us, to, it was a very good opportunity to see the home environment, to increase their involvement of a parent. They learned how to facilitate their child much better now and became more familiar with his equipment. And also higher rate of uh, participation in the, in the meetings because it was very convenient to join. And I think this is the most important thing that now when uh, we have condition like you can see on the picture and the bottom, we were in school already, but this child had to be at, at home isolated. But it was like this, we know we're taking the iPad with the Zoom, put it on and stand with Will and Wills, and that's it. It can participate. It's something that we never did before. So if we had a student that had to be at home because he, after a surgery or something, now he could participate. We know how to do it. And it's really great. And I will just uh, say uh, very quickly, quickly something about the policy in Israel, because I think it's, um, it is interesting. For in, in Israel, for children under the Ministry of Education, which means children aged four to 21, okay, this is in Israel under the uh, Ministry of Education. Before four, it's another ministry. And after 21, it's another ministry. Since 2018, we have a new regulation that's called Educational Individual Accessibility, which means in three areas, accommodation for physical accessibility, pedagogical and pedagogical technological accessibility, and school trips and activities within and with outside of the school building. I will talk because I talk about the pedagogical. If you have questions later, I can go back to the physical and trips. This is about the physical. I'm not going to talk about it. And this in the trips also, which is very important that all child deserve to have accessible in the trips. But about the, techno the technology accommodation, um, each student can get um, technol technology product for communication and learning also only. So if I said before about play and leisure, it's not here. They cannot get it for play or other things, just for learning and communication. It could be almost everything, laptop and iPad, software, switches, mounts, etc. The equipment belongs to the student, but we in charge of the professional use, which means that if I found out that the children, child has an iPad and is using it for YouTube all the time, I can take it away. So by law it's his, but I, I'm in charge of what's going on. 
the parents submit a request. There is a process between the parents are submitted and then there's a process which is a professional evaluation, decide if to give it or not to give it. Uh, it's really a collaborate process between the staff and the family. The big challenge that I find that there's a lot of resources and money in there. Yeah, There's a lot of equipment, but nothing is for implementation and for all the hours that the, the staff need to do. And there's a lot of time and resources if you want to implement it. And this is a very good conclusion that I want to say. Um, and another point that in every city, we have something that's called Matya, which is a staff that uh, in charge of the special education in the school, in the, sorry, in the city with OT and speech therapy, special education teacher, et cetera. And they are in charge of what's going on with the education uh, individual accessibility in this city. And that's it. Um, like we saw the technology has great potential to facilitate participation for students with disability. Um, it's very important to work professionally and to, and I'm em emphasize implementation, I think, and participation. School is more than math and language lesson. Um, think out of the box. We learn a lot from the COVID-19 and about the policy, you have to think about implementation, not just about the equipment. These are our apps, they're all free on the App Store. You're welcome to download it. I can send a link in the chat later. Um, we have a blog, you're very welcome to sign up. It's a Hebrew, English and Arabic uh, with a lot of tips. And we have a few webinars next weeks. Uh, they're all free in English. So I will send you also a link to those uh, webinars if you'd like to join. Thank you very much. This is my email address also. If but feel free to contact and ask questions. That's it. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Noah. That was a remarkably interesting, actually, presentation on issues that are a challenge for everyone and every organization, to be fair. So um, I would like to ask you if you have any questions on the uh, matters presented by Noah. Um, we have five minutes to do so. So if you feel you have any questions. Please either raise your hand or type it on the chat box. Uh, I have a question. I wanted to ask Noah about this uh, law that you mentioned in the end, because I find it very interesting. And I think it can be interesting also for our members in other countries. It's like a national law and is the state providing funding for the person and who whose initiative is it? I mean, yours as a service provider or the parents have to apply? How, how does it work? Uh, so it's, it's under the law of accessibility in Israel. It's one of the regulation under the law of uh, accessibility. And uh, so it came from there, actually. So it's something very national. Uh, but you need the, um, the professional to do it. So, like I said before, in each, it's almost each city or two or three cities together, it depends on the size of the city. We have the professional staff that are in charge of, so they get money, they get a budget for the one year, which is supposed to be enough for the amount of students that you have. They do this, um, I don't know the, the wording, they do this. Um, I don't have the word. They, they know how many students with disability you have in your um, city and they do like calculation. They think about exactly uh, how much money you need and then they give you the budget. Um, and you, you, each time you have a child, you, there, there is a process, you decide what he needs, you buy it for them and you get the money back from the government. So the, the city, they are in charge, the city hall, the cities, like the, the, they're in charge. They have by law, they need by law. If it, it, it's the same, like if you have a child in school that need elevator, okay? So you have to, by law, to, to supply elevator, right? If he's using a wheelchair. So it's now it's the same. If you need an iPad to communicate, the city have to, the city law ha, has to buy it for, for him, but they can get, and they get the money back for the government. Okay, thank you now. Um, one, one question, uh, sorry, uh, and uh, the assistive technology or the money is tied to tied to the student or tied to the to to the child. It's not it's not to the school for the school or for the class. 
Uh, no, no. So if if if, the, if if they're changing the class, for example, they can take it with yeah. them. Even even if the child leaving the city and go to another yeah. city is taking it yeah. with him. Okay. 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 It's his, but again, we have the responsibility. <clears throat> And I would like to add another thing that it's important. I didn't talk about all the physical, the chairs and the trips, but it's almost the same. Like you have to supply, uh, the, you have to take care that everything will be accessible on the trips and like chairs and tables and everything. It's also um, in there. By the way, also for the parents, it's another story, but it's also about parents with disability to children. It's also in the law. What? Okay, uh, thank you, Noam, uh, and thank you, Magdalena and Klaus, for the questions. I hope they uh, uh, have questions for, for answers for everyone. So um, now let me, uh, if we don't have any more questions, any, any hands, reason, raised, no. Any question in the chat box? I don't see anything. So. Uh, let me pass the floor to Klaus Hefner of Hilfsgemeinschaft, the Asian Association for the Visually Impaired. Klaus, the floor is... Yes, you. you can see my slides, hopefully. Yep. Yes. It's about, um, it's about the... I'm talking about a, a relatively new thing for me because I'm new, a new member in the SPD and I'm talking about a topic which I haven't uh, decided uh, in, in, in Salzburg in 2015, but uh, we are talking about the education declaration, uh, which will be renewed uh, within these days uh, in, the, in the member forum. Uh, building on the Salzburg declaration, declaration from the year 2050 on inclusive education, uh, which aims to raise the awareness of the importance of inclusive learning environments. Uh, it means they have three, three topics that are three main topics that are addressed. The one is inclusive learning environments. The second one is to identify the key barriers to inclusive education. And the third one is to provide the recommendation for policymakers and professionals in the field of ed education. And the declaration will also build on the EASPD's recent barometer report on the state of inclusive education in Europe, which I have seen yesterday, uh, for example. The, what does it mean defining inclusive learning environments? Um, uh, an inclusive education system uh, framework changes to adapt to uh, the needs of the learners to the individual learning level of the of the uh, of the learner, and is able to contribute to the learning environment. Inclusive education provides a uh, provider's adapt the learning environment to the in individual needs of the students and adopt to attitudes, approaches, and the strategies that include all learners in all activities. And this doesn't refer only to school system because when we when you see this keyword of a long a lifelong learning, but also refers to all levels of education in the human life course, preschools, vocational education and training and adult educational services. Where is it placed? In which framework is it placed? Uh, it's placed within the framework of the current legal and political uh, things, the United Nations Conventions of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the Salamanca Statement, which I don't know, I have to say, I'm sorry. <laughs> the European Disability Strategy, which was renewed uh, a few months ago, uh, as well as the European Education Area and the European Pillar of the Social Rights and the Child Guarantee, United Nations 2030 Agenda, etc. And we have to address, as we know it, we live it now, we live now for two years in this crisis, uh, the COVID-19 and its impact on education, which has a huge impact. The digital transition and the digital gap that we are facing, that's that's a problem that we have to, to, to address too. And the role of education in an inclusive society, uh, looking at the key transition 
transitions in a person's life. The barriers that we identified in inclusive education uh, are as followed the need for an increased awareness uh, of the education and potential and the rights of persons with disabilities. Uh, the need for a systemic modification of attitude and approach in the education system. That's one of the things that we uh, see here in Austria in a very predominant way. The lack of political will for inclusion, yeah. Um, that I, I, my, my personal, my personal view on this, on, on this point is that uh, we always have this uh, medical view on uh, persons with disabilities also in the educational system. Uh, in the political and uh, the political uh, uh, section of, of our society, the continued continued prevalence of two systems we have the inclusive and the segregated two, and there is a big fight uh, also here in Austria uh, for inclusion. The physical accessibility of school infrastructure, yeah, that's a lack of money, always the lack of money. Uh, the buildings, uh, to, to if new buildings are made, mostly uh, physical accessibility is taken is taken into consideration. Uh, but the old buildings, um, to rebuild them, costs a lot of money, and the school system doesn't have this this, this amount of money. One of my favorite things, uh, which I'm focusing on, is the accessibility of the e-learning environment, <clears throat> accessibility in general of uh, all the learning materials that you have and uh, the ability of the teaching personnel, uh, teaching staff, and also of the uh, parents, for example, uh, to transfer learning materials in an accessible to an accessible one to accessible ones. The use of the knowledge of assistive technology to support inclusion. Uh, the availability, availability of the appropriate training for teachers and school staff. There is no training at the moment in Austria, as I know it. Perhaps there is in other countries, there is a, a training and uh, one of the things I always say is uh, we have to bring it to the curricula of the universities. Uh, uh, this training uh, in so, uh, to support accessibility and uh, assistive technologies, knowledge, uh, to support all these things, we have to bring it in the curricula of the universities, for example, in the, in the curricula of the schools. Yeah. The access to additional support in mainstreaming educational setting, then the need to harmonize these definitions of disability in the European Union. Yeah, the, the big discussion, I think, through all the member forum groups, also uh, because of the need of the data collection on the state of inclusion. We don't have data, we don't have reliable data, we don't even have reliable data on persons with disabilities. How many persons with disabilities do, do we have? Uh, for example, in, in, in Austria, the last reliable figures are, are from, from 2008 here, for example. And the siloed working of stakeholders and the lack of cooperation, yeah, that's always the same thing. Uh, uh, yeah, and we have, for example, in Austria, we have nine different states in a little uh, federal states in a, in a, in a small country as big as uh, from the population as Israel. Uh, uh, we have 8.5 million persons living in Austria, but there are nine school systems, nine different school systems, yeah, and an umbrella uh, in the for the for the for the whole for the whole country. What will the declaration do? The declaration will address, uh, as said before, the stakeholders. Uh, the European policymakers, the national and the regional policymakers, education pro educational providers, the teachers and the trainers and the staff. Uh, and nothing is uh, set in stone. Um, I think we can discuss it uh, in, a, in a very broad range. And if there is anything missing, don't hesitate uh, to bring it into this to bring it into this, this discussion process. Uh, what can EASPD do? 
ESPT can provide information, good practices, and support to member uh, to member organizations in the on the different levels, uh, on the national levels, and to organize and promote trainings for teachers, educations, education personals, uh, and other training professionals on inclusive education and the use of the digital technology. That's one of the most important things in my uh, in my point of view. Uh, for the European policymaker side, uh, they have to allocate money, sufficient financial support for mainstream educations, education setting to provide inclusive environments, uh, and to provide money for the investments into digital technology. For the teachers, the trainers, and the staff, uh, yeah, they have to use. Uh, innovative learning methods, uh, and they have to use the technology which is available. available. No, 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 no. Hello. Okay. Noah, you have shown us some some very brilliant examples which you can use uh, of technologies that you can use, which are available freely on the market, for example. Uh, and please consider to implement teaching methods with uh, a universal design approach. And to, then, uh, one, of the, one of the important things is to transfer, <coughs> sorry, good practices among the teachers, the educators, and the other training personnel. So thank you very much. Uh, a short presentation on this, on this topic and feel free to contribute uh, whenever uh, whatever you want to you want to contribute. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus, for that interesting presentation on issues affecting uh, everyone. Right. Um, let me see. If, uh, let me ask you if you have any questions. Please raise your hand or take the mic to the floor. Any questions at all on the presentation by Klaus? Maybe I have a question Thanks, again. And I would like to ask, uh, sorry, not you, Klaus, maybe, but maybe the participants of the of the workshop, like the, the things that list that Klaus just listed, what are the most uh, important tasks or, or on different levels. Maybe I would like to ask, because I see that here are participants are from many different countries. What is the most urgent issue in your country? What is the, the most needed? Do you think that this is like a staff training, the, the teachers training to learn these innovative methods? Or maybe this is what we talked with Noah, that there is lack of uh, policy, or maybe there's lack of funding. So, uh, Maybe you could share with us also what is um, the, what in your countries would be the most needed, and this would also help us to to think what the SPD can do and how we can uh, support you. Anyone would like to share? How is it in in their country? Uh, let me say before some things. Uh, I think. Uh, there are some basic basic things that you have to, to, to consider if you don't have access to the school room uh, then uh, it doesn't make any it doesn't make any sense or it doesn't make much sense to 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 teach the uh, to have all these other things yeah? uh, so there should be some kind of ranking like self-assessment tool kind of something that person can check. What yeah. are the needs? What are available yeah. levels yeah. of support? And you have Elena. to rank it. And Elena, I can, can add a little bit. Yes. Hello, Hello. My, Hello. Yeah, my name is Ludmila. I came from Moldova. I'm regional director for Keystone Human Services International. I would like uh, just to say that evidently all the barriers that have been mentioned are very important, you know, for inclusive education. Um, uh, regarding the Moldova system of inclusive education, my organization one was one of uh, several organizations we implemented inclusive education, who promoted and implemented inclusive education in the country. Here in Moldova, starting with 2016, the inclusive education is um, 
like implemented nationwide while children including with disabilities they are um, uh, in uh, in mainstream schools and in mainstream classes with all with all other children there have been developed services like uh, we have support teachers uh, for children with uh, special educational needs there have been created uh, various types of diagnostic services and services to support uh, the um, uh, evaluation of educational needs and development of individual educational plans and so on and so on. We conducted uh, two impact studies. So, uh, the first one impact study was in 2015, let's say on uh, impact of inclusive education in pilot schools. Uh, the inclusive education was piloted in 60 schools in Moldova by uh, three, three NGOs. Uh, we had a very good relationship with the government. We supported the government to develop the methodologies for inclusive education and so on. But meantime, I would like to say that the most important and the, the most impact study show that is the teacher training, you know, because if the teacher are not prepared, you know, for uh, supporting, for, you know, uh, like doing that, uh, inclusive education for various types of children, because in the mainstream class you'll find children with various types of disabilities, you know. Uh, it is very, very difficult to implement inclusive education, and because of that, the level of the attitudes of teachers in the <clears throat> schools uh, sometimes is very discriminatory toward the children with disabilities. And this is shown also by both study, I would like to say. It, it was interesting that in 2016, we conducted like a, an impact study that covered two types of schools, schools that have been supported by non-governmental organizations, you know, for inclusive education. Uh, we conducted a lot of trainings for them and so on, and we monitored and mentored and so on and so on. And schools that uh, started implementation of inclusive education without having too much trainings, you know. And what we found that the level of discrimination is much higher among teachers working in a typical schools that have not been supported by non-governmental organizations, you know. <clears throat> and uh, evidently we come with a lot of recommendations uh, for the Ministry of Education here in Moldova uh, in order to, that to, to make more systemic this teacher training in inclusive education and more targeted because teachers, uh, let's say, they need to have systemic training and also by taking into consideration the uh, children with various types of disabilities they are working with in order not to left behind the children with more severe disabilities. This is like that. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Vila. Uh, basically, what you just mentioned is a common theme uh, uh, pointed out by Klaus as well. And I would like to take us, uh, we should take two steps back because I've noted that uh, there was a, a, a lack of political will, which is the first thing to take things to, a, to, to the next level. And also the inclusion of, of new curricula in, uh, in universities because that way is, I think it's the only way to have everyone that's interested uh, in uh, special education to be uh, educated on, on uh, latest things and have a basic knowledge of what needs to be done in order to include as many, as many children as possible or as many people as possible, if, if I may say. So uh, one thing that should take to the next level and uh, we should propose as uh, EHPD, I think we should uh, basically uh, say that the, the basic need is that we can't do much about the uh, uh, lack of political will, unfortunately, it's not in our hands, but we can do a lot about um, uh, uh, policy accommodation on having uh, yeah, you curricula. Are, in... You are right, Dionysus, but here one more lesson learned through my expertise in inclusive education. And this one is, I'm also teaching at the State University. I'm a professor in sociology. And I'd like just to tell you that uh, evidently curricula is very important, but here we need to have a very unique approach, not just one curricula for inclusive education, but integrate inclusive education in all existing curriculum, you know? This yes. is the, 
this is the biggest you know change even at the university level because if you come just with one curricula you will not change a lot this curricula can be like a specific course you know for let's say for the future teachers and so on but we need to think on how to integrate inclusive education like accessibility for all you know uh, in uh, in uh, all university and the uh, curriculums because that's important i couldn't agree more you're right uh, i was just saying that um we need to have a baseline of knowledge so if you uh inc include a uh, new curriculum in the universities then we start from a higher level so that's that's uh, that's, that's a start of course we should integrate uh all the uh the knowledge and the uh, uh, new things on uh, latest advancements on on uh education um they add something um i would like to add something i think it's so important uh what you just said ludmila um when i said that uh, there are no research for uh, resources for implementation that's exactly what i meant it's a lot about training for the teacher for the staff so yeah it's very important to start with the university but it's 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 not enough students are very in the early stage so we do have here like um courses from the ministry of education because it really led to have courses because they said uh, you know now we need to know more about how to use technology but it's not enough and we are a private organization we're a non-profit organization and actually we are in israel now leading the courses because we feel there is a gap between the need for using technology and the knowledge so professionals can be great but they don't have the knowledge how to use technology and people with disability are not using technology because the profession doesn't have the knowledge so there's a lot of work that has to be done about training and uh, it has to start in university but it, it has to continue also after um, because you have to use technology in the right way and uh, so it's not just about the equipment I think this is the main thing if we're talking about policy it's about training how to deliver the knowledge to the people the professionals uh, um, etc of course uh, and they also on how to evaluate you know the children with yeah. various types of disabilities you know because that's also important yes. and also we are talking also. about let's say support services like support teachers in classes what is their mm -hmm. role what is their responsibility how we can integrate this, you know, support teachers in a such a way that he will not uh, have, let's say, he will not teach segregating, you know, in the same class to the to the child, you know, that's also amazing. Exactly. Right. Yep. Yes, thank you, Noah. That was, that was to the point, actually. Um, another thing we should uh, note is the uh, something that has not been mentioned but although this, everything should be underlined by that and that's the ethics we should have uh, noting we should be noting behind all this inclusive education new methods and and all the uh, the uh, um, well uh, states and and national board of uh, uh, professional accreditation uh should have in mind and they should be uh giving new um i don't know um let's say um try to re-educate or uh say to people that what should be uh be careful of and uh, what they should be doing again and again over time or period of five years or uh, i don't know um but basically, that's a, that's a uh, really difficult issue and uh, it's lacking behind and we need to do something uh, everyone in, in everyone's country and push uh, to whichever uh, possible way in order to uh, include um, this sort of education, inclusive education and the use of technology in inclusive education. Any more questions, please? No, I'm just checking on the chat box as well. Nothing is there. Okay. Um, um, you, you know, I'll add here, talking about the STD role here, you know, I think that the STD role in this case will be definitively to help us to share like more of our expertise in the field because we, we 
we have plenty of expertise, you know, as members of ESPD and working in various countries, you know, in policy development, in policy implementation, in support services development, and even <clears throat> in technology development, you know. Practically, I do think that, that maybe uh, this is one of the biggest role of ES ESPD to support us to make this exchange of knowledge and practically would be very important uh, during this pandemic period, I think, because definitely we have a lot of lessons to learn during the pandemic period and after the pandemic period, you know, the, the, the most like uh, the people that were left behind during the pandemic period with the lockdown, for example, in my country, where children with disabilities and children with special educational needs, because they are from vulnerable families, because they have limited access to uh, technologies and even to performant mobile phones and so on, you know, and because they have limitation in assessing their support educational services. Mm -hmm. I think ESPD is in the process of collecting good practices in like Magdalena and sharing them to the best of the... Yeah, yeah, it would be nice to have the, all those practices. Uh, yes, yes, and uh, and uh, especially if we will develop this project, Denise's, this online practices that we it, online services, there we will collect also a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I I will make a note as well, and I will share it with Rachel, who is responsible for for education, and maybe we can do something together. This uh, uh, two member fora the technology member forum and education member forum and we could create like um this practice sharing or maybe a training or something in the in this inclusive education from techno technological point of view the, to to keep this knowledge and to to share these good practices i'm making a note thank you very much Ludmila. excellent uh there's nothing else. I don't know if there are any, any more comments on the uh, topics we've talked about. Uh, uh, anything? You know, I would like to, uh, to begin by thanking uh, Noah Nissen for her presentation. It was, uh, uh, it was really, really interesting. And Thank the presentation you. by Klaus. Uh, pointed out all the uh, issues um, and in your presentation concerning uh, uh, the Salzburg Declaration and all, that and all the other declarations. It was, uh, it was really uh, neatly pointed out. Um, thank you all, Magdalena. I don't know if you would like to add anything or not. Okay. Uh, with this, I would like to thank you all for participating and uh, being present uh, uh, in this um, uh, workshop uh, uh, on the use of technology in inclusive education and training. Uh, stay tuned for the rest of the uh, webinars and workshops and uh, thank you all for taking part and uh, being a part of our workshop.